I'm on a book tour, and I'm afraid you're going to get a bit of that. Um, what I've done is uh, to take the last chapter of my book. Jerry is so effectively uh, this afternoon covered all the evidence for evolution, which is what my book is about as well. So I wouldn't even attempt to do the same thing as that. Um, what I'm going to do is just take the last chapter. The last chapter of my book, There Is Grandeur, is based upon the last paragraph of Darwin's Origin of Species. Every section heading in my last chapter is one sentence of Darwin's last paragraph. So what I've done is just to take the last paragraph of Darwin and uh, make an exegesis of each sentence. Unlike his evolutionist grandfather, er Erasmus, whose scientific verse was somewhat surprisingly, I have to say, admired by Wordsworth and Coleridge, Charles Darwin was not known as a poet, but he rose to a lyrical crescendo in the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. <laughs> Clear-headed as ever, Darwin recognized the moral paradox at the heart of his great theory. He didn't mince words, but he offered the comforting reflection that nature has no evil intentions. Things simply follow from laws acting all around us. To quote an earlier sentence from the same paragraph, he had said something similar at the end of chapter 7 of The Origin. It may not be a logical deduction, but to my imagination, it is far more satisfactory to look at such instincts as the young cuckoo ejecting its foster brothers, ants making slaves, the larvae of ichneumonidae feeding within the live bodies of caterpillars, not as specially endowed or created instincts, but as small consequences of one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply, vary, let the strongest live, and the weakest die. One of the reasons, sometimes advanced by historians, for Darwin's loss of faith was his revulsion at the cruelty, or rather the callous indifference, of nature. This was not just an incidental fact. Darwin realized that it followed from the theory of natural selection itself. Darwin had a particular thing about the female ichneumon wasp's habit of stinging its victim to paralyze but not kill it, thereby keeping the meat fresh for its larva as it eats the live prey from within. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. That picture's not actually an ichneumon, it's a, di it's a digger wasp, Ammophila, which does the same thing. The story is even more macabre because the wasp, at least according to Fabre, methodically stings each ganglion down the ventral side of the caterpillar so that it stays alive but can't move. Darwin couldn't persuade himself that a beneficent creator would conceive such a habit. But with natural selection in the driving seat, all becomes clear, understandable, and sensible. Natural selection cares naught for any comfort. Why should it? For something to happen in nature, the only requirement is that the same happening in ancestral times assisted the survival of the genes promoting it. Gene survival is a sufficient explanation for the cruelty of wasps and the callous indifference of all nature, sufficient and satisfying to the intellect, if not to human compassion. Yes, there is grandeur in this view of life, and even a kind of grandeur in nature's serene indifference to the suffering that inexorably follows in the wake of its guiding principle, survival of the fittest. Theologians, if there are any present, <laughs> 
should feel free to wince at this echo of a familiar ploy in Theodicy, in which suffering is seen as an inevitable correlate of free will. Biologists, for their part, will find inexorably by no means too strong when they reflect on the biological function of the capacity to suffer. Suffering is there for a reason. It's a signal that all is not well, a signal to the animal to do something to reduce the suffering. If animals are not suffering, somebody, a predator perhaps or a parasite, isn't working hard enough at the business of gene survival. Scientists are human, and they're as entitled as anyone to revile cruelty and abhor suffering. But good scientists, like Darwin, recognize that truths about the real world have to be faced, however distasteful. Moreover, if we're going to admit subjective considerations, there is a fascination in the bleak logic that pervades all of life, including wasps homing in on the nerve ganglia down the length of their prey, cuckoos ejecting their foster brothers, slave-making ants, and the single-minded, or rather zero-minded, indifference to suffering shown by all parasites and predators. Darwin was bending over backwards to console when he concluded his chapter on the struggle for survival with these words. All that we can do is to keep steadily in mind that each organic being is striving to increase at a geometrical ratio, that each at some period of its life, during some season of the year, during each generation or at intervals, has to struggle for life and to suffer great destruction. When we reflect on this struggle, we may console ourselves with the full belief that the war of nature is not incessant, that no fear is felt, that death is generally prompt, and that the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy survive and multiply. Shooting the messenger is one of humanity's sillier foibles, and it underlies a good slice of the opposition to evolution that is so lamentably widespread, especially in America. Teach children that they're animals and they'll behave like animals. Even if it were true that evolution or the teaching of evolution encouraged immorality, that would not imply that the theory of evolution was false. It's quite astonishing how many people cannot grasp this simple point of logic. The fallacy is so common it even has a name, the argumentum ad consequentiam. X is true or false because of how much I like or dislike the consequences. <laughs> Is the production of the higher animals really the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving? Most exalted, really. Are there not more exalted objects? Art, spirituality, Romeo and Juliet, general relativity, the choral symphony, the Sistine Chapel, love. You have to remember that for all his modesty, Darwin nursed high ambitions. On his worldview, everything about the human mind, all our emotions and spiritual pretensions, all arts and mathematics, philosophy and music, all feats of intellect and exertions of spirit result from the same process that delivered the higher animals. It is not just that without evolved brains, spirituality and music would be impossible. More pointedly, brains were naturally evolved, naturally selected to increase in capacity and power for utilitarian reasons until those higher faculties of intellect and spirit emerged as a byproduct and blossomed in the cultural environment provided by group living and language. The Darwinian worldview does not denigrate the higher human faculties, doesn't reduce them to a plane of indignity. It doesn't even claim to explain them at the sort of level that will seem particularly satisfying in the way that, say, the Darwinian explanation of a tiger's teeth is satisfying but it does claim to have wiped out the impenetrable, not even worth trying to penetrate, mystery that must have dogged all efforts to understand in pre-Darwinian times. Whatever we think about that, does the production of the higher animals directly follow from the war of nature, from famine and death? Well, yes, it does. It directly follows if you understand Darwin's reasoning, but nobody understood it until the 19th century. And many still don't understand it, or perhaps are reluctant to do so. It isn't hard to see why. When you think about it, our own existence, together with its post-Darwinian explicability, is a candidate 
for the most astonishing fact that any of us are called upon to contemplate in our whole life, ever. I've lost count of the irate letters I've received from readers of books in which I've quoted Darwin's famous last paragraph, taking me to task for, as the writers think, deliberately omitting the vital phrase, by the creator. I think it comes up next, yes. These zealous correspondents forget that Darwin's great book went through six editions. In the first edition, the sentence is, as I've written it here, presumably bowing to pressure from the religious lobby, Darwin inserted by the creator in the second and all subsequent editions. Unless there's a very good reason to the contrary, when quoting the origin, I always quote the first edition. This is partly because my own copy of that historic print run of 1250 is one of my most precious possessions given me by my benefactor and friend Charles Simone. But it's also because the first edition is the most historically important. It's the one that thumped the Victorian solar plexus and drove out the wind of centuries. Moreover, later editions, especially the sixth, pandered to more than public opinion. In an attempt to respond to various learned but misguided critics of the first edition, Darwin backtracked and even reversed his position on a number of important points that he had actually got right in the first place. So for my money, having been originally breathed, it is, with no mention of any creator. It seems that Darwin regretted this sop to religious opinion. In a letter of 1863 to his friend, the botanist Joseph Hooker, he said, but I have long regretted that I truckled to public opinion and used the pentateuchal term of creation, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. The pentateuchal term Darwin's referring to is the word creation, of course. The context, as Francis Darwin explains in his 1888 edition of his father's letters, was that Darwin was writing to thank Hooker for the loan of a review of a book by Carpenter, in which the anonymous reviewer had spoken of a creative force, which Darwin could only express in pentateuchal terms as the primordial form into which life was originally breathed. Nowadays, we should dispense even with the originally breathed. What is it that is supposed to have been breathed into what? Presumably, the intended reference was to some kind of breath of life. But what might that mean? The harder we look at the border between life and non-life, the more elusive does the distinction become. Life, the animate, was supposed to have some sort of vibrant, throbbing quality, some vital essence, made to sound yet more mysterious when dropped into French, élan vital. Life, it seemed, was made of a special living substance, a witch's brew called protoplasm. Conan Doyle's Professor Challenger, a fictional character even more preposterous than Sherlock Holmes, discovered that the Earth was a living, kind of giant sea urchin, with its shell being the crust that we see and its core comprising pure protoplasm. Right up to the middle of the 20th century, life was thought to be qualitatively beyond physics and chemistry. No longer. The difference between life and non-life is a matter not of substance, but of information. Living things contain prodigious quantities of information. Most of the information is digitally coded in DNA, and there's also a substantial quantity coded in other ways, as we shall see presently. To get an idea of the dramatic impact of the molecular biology revolution, the Watson-Crick revolution, on our whole attitude to life, listen to another last paragraph, this time from the authoritative Short History of Biology, written by Charles Singer in 1931. Despite interpretations to the contrary, the theory of the gene is not a mechanist theory. The gene is no more comprehensible as a chemical or physical entity than is the cell, or for that matter, the organism itself. Further, though the theory speaks in terms of genes as the atomic theory speaks in terms of atoms, it must be remembered that there is a fundamental distinction between the two theories. Atoms exist independently, and their properties as such can be examined. They can even be isolated. Though we cannot see them, 
we can deal with them under various conditions and in various combinations. We can deal with them individually, not so the gene. It exists only as part of the chromosome, and the chromosome only as part of a cell. If I ask for a living chromosome, that is, for the only effective kind of chromosome, no one can give it to me except in its living surroundings, any more than he can give me a living arm or leg. The doctrine of the relativity of functions is as true for the gene as it is for any of the organs of the body. This is Craig Venter. By the way, that you're supposed to realize that, that, that everything that I've just read from Charles Singer is complete and utter nonsense. And yet it's what, it's, it's what we all thought before Watson and Crick came along. Before Watson and Crick came along, there was something mysterious. You could wax lyrical about the, the interactions of all parts of the body and the genes were parts of the living organism and th things like that. Now we know genes are pure information, digital information. This is Craig Venter. On the right is a photograph of what he looks like. On the left is a complete recipe for making a new Craig Venter. In a hundred years, Craig Venter will be long dead, but his genome will be preserved in libraries throughout the world. By then, embryological technology will have advanced to the point where it will be easy to render the letters in the library copy of that book back into their original DNA form, inject them into a denucleated egg, implant it into a woman, and bring into the world a new Craig Venter. It will not be Craig Venter, it will be an identical twin who will very probably grow into a brilliant scientist, although the science he studies will be very different, because the world of science will have moved on hugely in a hundred years. But the only point I want to make is the remarkable fact that our entire genome can be reversibly translated into letters of the alphabet and stored on paper or on a computer disk. From an evolutionary point of view, the DNA, which is characteristic of any species, is naturally selected so that it becomes a set of instructions for surviving and reproducing in the normal environment of that species. But bird DNA includes instructions for how to build wings and how to build a nervous system that knows how to fly with them. Dolphin DNA includes instructions for how to swim. Aardvark DNA includes instructions for how to dig. Octopus DNA includes instructions for how to change color and so on. The genetic database of a species will become a storehouse of information about the environments of the past, environments in which ancestors survived and passed on the genes that helped them to do so. To the extent that present and future environments resemble those of the past, mostly they do, this genetic book of the dead will turn out to be a useful manual for survival in the present and future. The repository of that information will, at any one moment, reside in individual bodies, but in the longer term, where reproduction is sexual and DNA is shuffled from body to body, the database of survival instructions will be the gene pool of the species. Each individual's genome in any one generation will be a sample from the species database. Different species will have different databases because of their different ancestral worlds like sand bluffs cast into fantastic shapes by the desert winds. The database in the gene pool of camels will encode information about deserts and how to survive in them. The DNA in mole gene pools will contain instructions and hints for survival in dark, moist soil. The DNA in predator gene pools will increasingly contain information about prey animals, their evasive tricks and how to outsmart them. The DNA in prey gene pools will come to contain information about predators and how to dodge and outrun them. The DNA in all gene pools contains information about parasites and how to resist their pernicious invasions. Information on how to handle the present so as to survive into the future is necessarily gleaned from the past. Non-random survival of DNA in ancestral bodies is the obvious way in which information from the past is recorded for future use, and this is the route by which the primary database of DNA is built up. <laughs>
but there are three further ways in which information about the past is sequestered and used to improve future survival. These are the immune system, the nervous system, and culture. Along with wings, lungs, and all the other apparatus for survival, each of the three secondary information gathering systems was ultimately prefigured by the primary one, natural selection of DNA. We could call them together the four memories. The first memory is the DNA repository of ancestral survival techniques, written on the moving scroll that is the gene pool of the species. I've said enough about this and we'll say no more. The second memory. Just as the inherited database of DNA records the recurrent details of ancestral environments and how to survive them, the immune system, the second memory, does the same thing for diseases and other insults to the body during the individual's own lifetime. This database of past diseases and how to survive them is unique to each individual and is written in the repertoire of proteins we call antibodies. One population of antibodies for each pathogen precisely tailored by past experience with the proteins that characterize the pathogen. Like many children of my generation, I had measles and chickenpox. My body remembers the experience, the memories being embodied in antibody proteins, along with the rest of my personal database of previously vanquished invaders. I fortunately never had polio, but medical science has cleverly devised techniques, vaccination, for planting false memories of diseases never suffered. I shall never contract polio because my body thinks it has done so in the past and my immune system database is equipped with the appropriate antibodies, fooled into making them by the injection of a harmless version of the virus. Fascinatingly, as the work of various Nobel Prize winning medical scientists has shown, the immune system's database is itself built up by a quasi-Darwinian process of random variation and non-random selection. But in this case, the non-random selection is not selection of bodies for their capacity to survive, but of proteins within the body for their capacity to envelop or otherwise neutralize invading proteins. The third memory is the one we ordinarily think of when we use the word, the memory that resides in the nervous system. By mechanisms that we don't yet fully understand, our brains retain a store of past experiences to parallel the antibody memory of past diseases and the DNA memory, for so we can regard it, of ancestral deaths and successes. At its simplest, the third memory works by a trial and error process that can be seen as yet another analogy to natural selection. When searching for food, an animal may try various actions. Though not strictly random, this trial stage is a reasonable analogy to genetic mutation. The analogy to natural selection is reinforcement, the system of rewards, positive reinforcement, and punishments, negative reinforcement. An action such as turning over leaves, trial, turns out to yield beetle larvae and wood lice hiding under the leaves, reward. The nervous system has a rule that says any trial action that is followed by reward should be repeated. Any trial action that is followed by nothing, or worse, followed by punishment, for example, pain, should not be repeated. The third memory, the one in the brain, has spawned a fourth. The database in my brain contains more than just a record of the happenings and sensations of my personal life, although that was the limit when brains originally evolved. Your brain includes collective memories inherited non-genetically from past generations, handed down by word of mouth or in writing or nowadays on the internet. The world in which you and I live is richer by far because of who went before us and inscribed their impacts on the database of human culture. Newton and Marconi, Shakespeare and Steinbeck, Bach and the Beatles, Stevenson and the Wright brothers, Jenner and Salk, Curie and Einstein, von Neumann and Berners-Lee. And of course, Darwin. All four memories are part of or manifestations of the vast superstructure of apparatus for survival, which was originally and primarily built up by the Darwinian process of non-random DNA survival. Darwin was right to hedge his bets, but today we're pretty certain that all living creatures on this planet are descended from a single ancestor. The evidence, as uh, 
Jerry, I think it was, said today, is that the genetic code is universal, all but identical across animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, archaea, and viruses. The 64-word dictionary by which three-letter DNA words are translated into 20 amino acids and one punctuation mark is the same 64-word dictionary wherever you look in the living kingdoms, with one or two exceptions too minor to undermine the generalization. If, say, some weird anomalous microbes called the harem scariotes were discovered, which didn't use DNA at all, or didn't use proteins, or used proteins but strung them together from a different set of amino acids from the familiar 20, or which used DNA but not in a triplet code, or a triplet code but not the same 64-word dictionary, if any of these conditions were met, we might suggest that life had originated twice, once for the harem scariotes and once for the rest of life. For all Darwin knew, indeed for all anyone knew before the discovery of DNA, some existing creatures might have had the properties I have here attributed to the harem scariotes, in which case into a few forms, in Darwin's words, would have been justified. Is it possible that two independent origins of life could both have hit upon the same 64-word code? Very unlikely. For that to be plausible, the existing code would have to have strong advantages over alternative codes, and there would have had to be a gradual ramp of improvement towards it, a ramp for natural selection to climb up. Both these conditions are improbable. Francis Crick earlier suggested that the genetic code is a frozen accident, which once in place was difficult or impossible to change. And the reasoning's interesting. Any mutation in the genetic code itself, as opposed to mutations in the genes that it encodes, would have an instantly catastrophic effect, not just in one place, but throughout the whole organism. If any word in the 64-word dictionary changed its meaning so that it came to specify a different amino acid, just about every protein in the body would instantaneously change, probably in many places along its length. Unlike an ordinary mutation, which might, say, slightly lengthen a leg, shorten a wing, or darken an eye, a change in the genetic code would change everything at once all over the body. And this would spell disaster. Various theorists have come up with ingenious suggestions for special ways in which the genetic code might evolve. Ways in which, to quote one of their papers, the frozen accident might be thawed. Interesting as these are, I think it's all but certain that every living creature whose genetic code has been looked at is descended from one common ancestor. No matter how elaborate and different the high-level programs that underlie the various life forms all are at bottom written in the same machine language. Of course, we can't rule out the possibility that other machine languages may have arisen in yet other creatures that are now extinct, the equivalent of my harem scariotes. And the physicist Paul Davies has made the reasonable point that we haven't actually looked very hard to see if there are any harem scariotes. He doesn't use the word, of course. Any that are not extinct but still lurking in some extreme redoubt of our planet. He admits that it's not very likely, but argues rather along the lines of the man who searches for his keys under a street lamp rather than where he lost them, that it's a lot easier and cheaper to look thoroughly on our planet than to travel to other planets and look there. Meanwhile, I don't mind recording my private expectation that Professor Davis won't find anything, and that all surviving life forms on this planet use the same machine code and are descended from a single ancestor. Uh, this whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity. Cycling on means going round the sun, and of course it is uh, vitally important for life that the planet on which it's, it, it, it lives should be in, in orbit around a star for a, for a source of energy. If the planet were not in orbit around a star, life would be completely impossible. The only alternative to orbiting a star is hurtling through the void, dark, close to absolute zero temperature, alone and far from the source of energy that enables life to trickle upstream, temporally and locally, against the thermodynamic torrent. Darwin's use of cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity is more than just a poetic device to express the relentless and unimaginably extended passage of time. Being in orbit around a star is the only way a body can remain a relatively fixed distance away from a source of energy.
Why is it so important? Well, the laws of thermodynamics state that although... No, right, yes. The laws of thermodynamics state that although energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can, must in a closed system, become more impotent to do useful work. That's what it means to say that entropy increases. Work includes things like pumping water uphill, or the chemical equivalent, extracting carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide and using it in plant tissues. Both those feats can be achieved only if energy is fed into the system. For example, electrical energy to drive the water pump or solar energy to drive the synthesis of sugar and starch in a green plant. Once the water has been pumped to the top of the hill, it will then tend to flow downhill and some of the energy of its downward flow can be used to drive a water wheel, which can generate electricity, which can drive an electric motor to pump some of the water uphill again, but only some. Some of the energy is always lost, though never destroyed. Perpetual motion machines, you can't say it too dogmatically, are impossible. In life's chemistry, the carbon extracted from the air by sun-driven uphill chemical reactions in plants can be burned to release some of the energy. We can literally burn it in the form of coal, which you can think of as stored solar energy, for it was put there by the solar panels of long-dead plants in Carboniferous and other past times. Or the energy may be released in a more controlled way than actual combustion. Inside living cells, either of plants or of animals that eat plants, or of animals that eat animals that eat plants, etc. Sun-made carbon compounds are slow-burned. Instead of literally bursting into flames, they give up their energy in a serviceable trickle, where it works in a controlled manner to drive uphill chemical reactions. Inevitably, some of this energy is wasted as heat. If it were not, we'd again have a perpetual motion machine, which, you can't say it too often, is impossible. Almost all the energy in the universe is steadily being degraded from forms that are capable of doing work to forms that are incapable of doing work. There's a leveling off, a mixing up, until eventually the entire universe will settle into a uniform, uneventful heat death. But while the universe as a whole is hurtling downhill towards its inevitable heat death, there is scope for small quantities of energy to drive little local systems in the opposite direction. Water from the sea is lifted into the air as clouds, which later deposit their water on mountaintops, from which it runs downhill in streams and rivers, which can drive water wheels or electric power stations. The energy to lift the water, and hence to drive the turbines in the power stations, comes from the sun. It's not a violation of the second law, for energy is constantly being fed in from the sun. The sun's energy is doing something similar in green leaves, driving chemical reactions locally uphill to make sugar and starch and cellulose and plant tissues. Eventually, the plants die, or they may be eaten by animals first. The trapped solar energy has the opportunity to trickle down through numerous cascades and through a long and complex food chain culminating in bacterial or fungal decay of the plants or the animals that prolong the food chain. Or some of it may be sequestered underground, first as peat, and then as coal. But the universal trend towards ultimate heat death is never reversed. In every link of the food chain and through every trickle-down cascade within every cell, some of the energy is degraded to uselessness. Perpetual motion machines are, all right, that's enough repetition, but I won't apologize for quoting, as I've done in at least one previous book, the marvelous saying of Sir Arthur Eddington on the subject. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. When creationists say, as they frequently do, that the theory of evolution contradicts the second law of thermodynamics, they are telling us no more than that they don't understand the second law. We already knew that they don't understand evolution. There is no contradiction because of the sun.
The whole system, whether we're talking about life or about water rising into the clouds and falling again, is finally dependent on the steady flow of energy from the sun. While never actually disobeying the laws of physics and chemistry, and certainly never disobeying the second law, energy from the sun powers life to coax and stretch the laws of physics and chemistry to evolve prodigious feats of complexity, diversity, beauty, and an uncanny illusion of statistical improbability and deliberate design. So compelling is that illusion that it fooled our greatest minds for centuries until Charles Darwin burst onto the scene. Natural selection is an improbability pump, a process that generates statistical improbability. It systematically seizes the minority of random changes that have what it takes to survive and accumulates them, step by tiny step, over unimaginable timescales until evolution eventually climbs mountains of improbability and diversity, peaks whose height and range seem to know no limit, the metaphorical mountain that I've called Mount Improbable. The improbability pump of natural selection driving living complexity up Mount Improbable is a kind of statistical equivalent of the sun's energy raising water to the top of a conventional mountain. Life evolves greater complexity only because natural selection drives it locally away from the statistically probable towards the improbable. And this is possible only because of the ceaseless supply of energy from the sun. We know a great deal about how evolution has worked ever since it got started, much more than Darwin knew. But we know no more than Darwin did about how it got started in the first place. This is a book about evidence, and we have no evidence bearing upon the momentous event that was the start of evolution on this planet. It could have been an event of supreme rarity. It only had to happen once, and as far as we know, it only did happen once. It's even possible that it only happened once in the entire universe, although I doubt that. One thing we can say on a basis of pure logic rather than evidence is that Darwin was sensible to say from so simple a beginning. The opposite of simple is statistically improbable. Statistically improbable things don't spontaneously spring into existence. That is what statistically improbable means. The beginning had to be simple, and evolution by natural selection is still the only process we know whereby simple beginnings can give rise to complex results. Darwin didn't discuss how evolution began in The Origin of Species. He thought the problem was beyond the science of his day. In the letter to Hooker that I quoted earlier, Darwin went on to say, it is mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. He didn't rule out the possibility that the problem would eventually be solved. Indeed, the problem of the origin of matter largely has been solved, but only in the distant future. Quote again, it will be some time before we see slime, protoplasm, etc., generating a new animal. At this point in his edition of his father's letters, Francis Darwin inserted a footnote telling us, on the same subject, my father wrote in 1871, it is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are now present, which could ever have been present. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At the present day, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. Charles Darwin was here doing two rather distinct things. On the one hand, he was presenting his only speculation on how life might have originated, the famous Warm Little Pond passage. On the other hand, he was disabusing present-day science of the hope of ever seeing the event replicated before our eyes. Even if the conditions for the first production of a living organism are still present, any such new production would be instantly devoured or absorbed, presumably by bacteria, we would ha today have good reason to add. Darwin wrote that seven years after Louis Pasteur had said in a, letter at the so in a lecture at the Sorbonne, Never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow struck by this simple experiment. The simple experiment was the one in which Pasteur showed, contrary to popular expectation at the time, that broth sealed off from access by microorganisms would not spoil.
Demonstrations such as Pasteur's are sometimes cited by creationists as evidence in their favor. The false syllogism runs as follows. Spontaneous generation is never nowadays observed, therefore the origin of life is impossible. Darwin's 1871 remark was precisely designed as a riposte to that kind of illogicality. Evidently, the spontaneous generation of life is a very rare event, but it must have happened once, and this is true whether you think the original spontaneous generation was a natural or a supernatural event. The question of just how rare an event the origin of life was is an interesting one. I'm not sure what Darwin meant by endless in this final sentence of the book. It could have been just a superlative deployed to soup up most beautiful and most wonderful. I expect that was part of it. But I like to think that Darwin meant something more particular by endless. As we look back on the history of life, we see a picture of never-ending, ever-rejuvenating novelty. Individuals die, and species, families, orders, and even classes go extinct. But the evolutionary process itself seems to pick itself up and resume its recurrent flowering with undiminished freshness, with unabated youthfulness, as epoch gives way to epoch. The fact of our own existence is almost too surprising to bear. So is the fact that we are surrounded by a rich ecosystem of animals that more or less closely resemble us, by plants that resemble us a little less and on which we ultimately depend for our nourishment, by bacteria that resemble our remoter ancestors and to which we shall all return in decay when our time is past. Darwin was way ahead of his time in understanding the magnitude of the problem of our existence as well as in tumbling to its solution. He was ahead of his time, too, in appreciating the mutual dependencies of animals and plants and all other creatures in relationships whose intricacy staggers the imagination. How is it that we find ourselves not merely existing, but surrounded by such complexity, such elegance, such endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful? The answer is this. It could not have been otherwise, given that we are capable of noticing our existence at all and of asking questions about it. It is no accident, as cosmologists point out to us, that we see stars in our sky. There may be universes without stars in them, universes whose physical laws and constants leave the primordial hydrogen evenly spread and not concentrated into stars. But nobody is observing those universes because entities capable of observing anything cannot evolve without stars. Not only does life need at least one star to provide energy, stars are also the furnaces in which the majority of the chemical elements are forged, and you can't have life without a rich chemistry. We could go through all the laws of physics one by one and say the same thing of all of them. It is no accident that we see dot, dot, dot. And the same is true of biology. It is no accident that we see green almost wherever we look. It is no accident that we find ourselves perched on one tiny twig in the midst of a blossoming and flourishing tree of life. No accident that we are surrounded by millions of other species eating, growing, rotting, swimming, walking, flying, burrowing, stalking, chasing, fleeing, outpacing, outwitting. Without green plants to outnumber us at least ten to one, there would be no energy to power us. Without the ever-escalating arms races between predators and prey, parasites and hosts, without Darwin's war of nature, without his famine and death, there would be no nervous systems capable of seeing anything at all, of appreciating and understanding it. We are surrounded by endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, and it is no accident, but the direct consequence of evolution by non-random natural selection, the only game in town, the greatest show on earth. Thank you very much.